When John E. Brandenburg, who holds a Ph.D. in theoretical plasma physics from UC Davis, in 2011 sent a thesis paper to the Pentagon suggesting a nuclear explosion took place on Mars in the distant past, the Pentagon said, why don't you publish it? Let's explore. Hi everyone and welcome to Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. I am Thor and thanks for tuning in. Okay folks, this episode is as far as I will go into an arena of complex science because I am not a geophysicist nor am I a nuclear engineer, but I can read and I can follow logic and that's what I will present here because it is too important to ignore. I promise follow-up episodes to be lighter and more quote-unquote normal topics like alien abduction, but hang with me here, this is very interesting. Since publishing evidence of a massive thermonuclear explosion on Mars in the past, in 2014 and 15, Dr. Brandenburg has traveled the conference circles in astronomy, geophysics, Mars society, as well as New Horizons conferences, encountering both friendly and hostile environments. I'm not speaking on his behalf here, but just doing my best, transcribing the tenet of his conclusions, based on synthesizing a mountain of data. Here's what we know. This mountain of data consists of orbiter data dating back to the 1970s, and not just from the Viking missions, but also from Russian orbital missions, gamma ray spectrometer data, and then there's the Mars lander data and a mountain of brand new Mars rover data, dating back almost 20 years. Additionally, there's telescopic data as well as analysis of meteorites landed on Earth originating from Mars. All of these sources are established and accepted factual data sources. Our understanding of Mars has evolved dramatically over the last 15 years because of the data provided by the rovers, and it offers, for those who can read it, a narrative history of Mars so dramatic, revealing, and voluminous that it will take years more to decipher, and more data keeps pouring in. We're in the midst of this discovery period right now, and that's why some ideas currently surfacing, like that of Dr. Brandenburg, may be a bit uncomfortable. The mainstream approach to the analysis is modeled after lunar synthesis dating back to the 1960s. That suggests Earth is exotic and atypical. That's why it is the only planet with life, which is also a religious doctrine, whereas every other celestial body does not, and never did, support life. Proof number one, the lunar surface is dust, bombarded by meteors and asteroids for eons, and so too would be the surface of Mars, Mercury, Venus, etc. But what if what we find on Mars is a smooth northern hemisphere and a bombarded highlands of its equator in southern regions? Because that's what we found. Why so smooth in the north, since Mars has been bombarded as the moon for eons? And it is next to the asteroid belt as well, much closer to the bombardment. Remember the side of the moon facing away is super bombarded, whereas the side always facing Earth has a face. It's less bombarded because it faces the Earth, it has a protection by the Earth. The explanation for the smooth north surface on Mars is also because of a protection layer. It used to be covered with water. This is Mars's dichotomy and explains its smooth northern plains and southern highlands bombarded with meteors. But it's not illogical if you allow there to have been water, abundance of water, covering the northern hemisphere. And this uneven distribution of land and sea should not be a surprise to us at all, because on Earth, the Pacific Ocean used to cover half of our planet as well, before the tectonic plate separated. On Earth, we can analyze layers in the Grand Canyon showing an oxygen-rich past. Yes, oxygen leaves a signature 
as oxidized sediments. At the bottom of the Grand Canyon, as an example, at only a mile in depth, there are layers of oxygenation. On Mars, however, inside the five-mile-deep Gale Crater, we also see massive oxygenation in its sediments, revealing a past on Mars rich in oxygen. And how do we get oxygen? Photosynthesis of plants. And photosynthesis is a self-propelling creator of oxygen. More photosynthesis, more oxygen. The oxygenation on Mars points to an atmosphere, and water, and weather, and ocean, and photosynthesis, a biological sphere, not unlike that of Earth, with all the potential life it can nurture and evolve, lasting for millions, possibly hundreds of millions of years. The science community now agrees that the surface of Mars shows evidence of rivers, rock carvings just like that of Earth, created by not just rivers of water, but ocean tsunamis, which other sediments show evidence of on the surface of the northern plains. This is now accepted science. The tsunami formations, the waterways, the riverbeds, the lake beds, found in several craters, these took millions of years to form while water was present on Mars. It was there for a long time. So how did it disappear? If you read Wikipedia, it will tell you this, quote, given the proposal of a vast primordial ocean on Mars, the fate of the water requires an explanation. As the Martian climate cooled, the surface of the ocean would have frozen and parts of it remain frozen, buried beneath a thin layer of rock, debris and dust, end quote. I don't think subterranean freeze explains the disappearance of vast oceans of water covering the northern hemisphere of Mars, a body of water larger than the Pacific. Something more catastrophic must have catapulted the ocean water off-planet into space. A complete loss of atmosphere would have done this, when evaporation is no longer trapped in a greenhouse convection cycle. Now, here comes the science. We have an isotopic spectrum baseline for the entire solar system, that includes Xenon-132 and Xenon-129 in equal proportions, as well as most other minerals, rare metals, isotopes, and more. In this picture, Mars is anomalous, unique. Evidence number one, its Xenon-129 is two and a half times as abundant as Xenon-132. Everywhere else, it's equal. And on Mars, so is Argon-40 dominant, and so is Krypton-80, both abundant, only on Mars. And why is there Krypton-80 on Mars at all? You see, Krypton-80 is new to us on Earth as well. It's been here only since about 1945, and its presence can only be duplicated by throwing a lava rock, as an example, into a nuclear reactor having it bombarded by neutrons. Only then do you get Krypton-80. And guess what else happens through nuclear reaction? That would be a hydrogen bomb. You get Xenon-129 as well, over Xenon-132, just like on Mars. Scientific norms and data are the fact guides here, and science shows high level of radiation on the surface of Mars. This radioactive layer has a super long shelf life, like hundreds of millions of years. So what are we saying? Was there a nuclear explosion on Mars millions of years ago? 180 million years ago to be exact, like the data suggests? Or could this have happened naturally? Theoretically, yes. But a natural thermonuclear fission would have left signatures. You see, deep in Earth caves, we can find rich uranium that, when water sediments and pressure is applied, can turn into plutonium naturally. But for it to explode, and we don't have evidence of this ever happening on Earth, but if a meteor hit it directly, creating conditions of significant compression of air, then we could create a fission reaction. But even so, it would have left a crater, a giant crater, so where are these craters on Mars? Here's where it gets interesting. Science says 
The highest concentration of radioactivity on the surface of Mars is in two pools in the Northern Hemisphere, a giant one over Mare Acidalium and a second smaller one over Utopia Planum. And here's where I will deliberately start making connections. Mare Acidalium is a stone throw away from Cydonia, on the shoreline of what once was a vast ocean in the Northern Hemisphere on Mars. Richard C. Hoekland pointed our attention to the structures in Cydonia, the phase, the pyramid, the city, the fortress, and the geometric connections between them. All those exact 45, 60, and 90 degree angles, remember? And now here's data suggesting a nuclear explosion having taken place very much nearby, about 180 million years ago. And I must add, this is not where Dr. Brandenburg typically goes in his presentations generally. This is an added layer. So why is there no crater? Because it happened over ocean, not in the ocean, but in the air, at low altitude levels. That would explain the absence of craters. A meteor, no matter the speed, material composition, or density, would have exploded so close to Earth with fission results. So it's not comparable to Tunguska 1908. Here we're talking a controlled fission fusion thermonuclear explosion, leaving all the telltale scientific signatures like radiation and isotopic remains. We now know from our own similar explosions in the air since the 1940s and only since the 1940s. They are identical. This includes acid-etched classification of rock at the site of explosion, leaving clear albedo marks, signs of reflectivity. Another physical signature compares to the dual fusion-fission reaction of a hydrogen bomb, which is basically a nuclear bomb detonated in a compressed hydrogen chamber, using uranium camper and casing, where neutrons from the nuclear fusion split the uranium-238 to double the yield, and uranium-238 is Earth's signature proof of a hydrogen bomb, and uranium-238 is also present in these two spots on Mars. A hydrogen bomb leaves a huge fallout downwind on Earth, and it did on Mars as well. You can chase the 238 downwind over Cydonia and beyond. When you add a recently published third source, the account of remote viewing of planet Mars, as discovered by Joe McMonico, connecting with beings in distress under the surface of Mars millions of years ago, waiting for rescue where the Mars atmosphere was all but gone due to a catastrophe, with its water evaporating into space. These combined narratives make for an incredibly dramatic story, a glimpse of Mars's rich past, its history of life, increasingly obvious, perhaps intelligent, based on science and data, we're able to gather, organize, and observe, if we have the courage to accept the story it tells. You can watch and listen to this and other podcasts on Project Blue Book, where we explore all things unidentified. Each day, let's practice compassion and kindness. And please subscribe. I am Thor, and thanks for tuning in. See you next time.